put, I am going to put our slide deck or a link to our slide deck in the chat for anybody who's interested. Welcome to reparative cataloging in the WRLC. Uh, today, I will be, uh, I'm Jen Frachel. I'm the Metadata Services Librarian at George Washington University. I'm the current chair of the our, uh, reparative cataloging subgroup of the Metadata Committee. I'm joined today by Trisha McKenzie, who is the past chair. She's the head of Metadata Services at George Mason University and Jackie Saavedra, who is the Consortial Network Zone Manager in the WRLC. So before we begin today, I do want to uh, please be aware that the controlled vocabularies and descriptions we use or encounter in our work contain prejudicial, biased, and or dehumanizing terms. Our usage of any of these terms today does not reflect our approval of said terms. Unfortunately, we can't discuss the need of the work or the work of reparative cataloging itself without acknowledging that these terms exist and may or may not currently be the authorized terms in the controlled vocabularies that we use. Now, before we talk about the work going on within the WRLC and the work being led by the reparative cataloging subgroup, uh, we first wanna get on the same page about what reparative cataloging is. So reparative cataloging is used pretty interchangeably with other terms like reparative description, ethical cataloging, and often comes within a larger umbrella of radical librarianship. There is no one term uh, across the profession to describe what reparative cataloging is, and there's no professionally wide accepted definition. But our colleagues in the Society of American Archivists have a definition that's uh, pretty good that we'll use. So their definition is the remediation of data that exclude silence, harm, or mischaracterize marginalized people in the data created or used by archivists to identify or characterize archival resources. Now, while this definition specifically covers archives, archivists, and archival materials, it does cover and highlight the work that we do within libraries and specialized collections. And now that we've established what reparative cataloging or reparative description is, why do we need it? Well, like many parts of our society, we work within systems that contain bias and oppression. Uh, our taxonomies, controlled vocabularies like the Library of Congress subject headings and materials as well as their descriptions are products of their time and the people who created them. And as our systems and as our materials become more inclusive and more people have a voice to be heard at that table, we need to update the descriptive languages that we use and how we, uh, how we need to fill those previous gaps that we're uh, with appropriate language. And appropriate either means that it's more respectful of the individuals and the communities that they're describing, these words are describing or more representative in general of all of the facets of human existence and identity. Now, I'm going to pass the, the mic over to Jackie, who is going to tell you about the work that we have completed in the WRLC and what is in process. Thank you, Jen. Hello, everyone. So I'll be discussing the work the subgroup has completed so far and work that's still in process. So in June of 2021, our group conducted a survey of WRLC staff. The staff who filled out the survey represented many different library areas, including access services, special collections, reference, cataloging, et cetera. 
When asked to discuss what efforts towards reparative cataloging their institutions were already doing, some people pointed to updating Library of Congress subject headings, solidifying new internal policies for name authority records, replacing offensive cutters and call numbers, and exploring more diversity-friendly vocabularies. For special collections, the work included reviewing the language in finding aids. And in terms of overall library staff awareness, some of the work done by institutions included open discussions, working groups, diversity, equity, and inclusion staff gatherings or DEI staff gatherings, as well as creating a library statement of values. But a good number of people who took the survey also stated they didn't know what measures had been taken by their libraries in terms of reparative cataloging and similar DEI work. Next slide. Thank you. Not only did we want to know what work had already been done, but we also wanted to know what work WRLC staff would like to be accomplished in the future in terms of cataloging. Some of the things that were suggested were things like developing best practices, fostering a collaborative group approach, preparing consortium-wide strategies for updating and replacing subject headings, and continuing discussions about what other institutions are doing in this area. We also wanted to know if their institution already had a process in place for patrons and staff to report problematic language and catalog records. The majority of people surveyed either said no or that they weren't sure if there was a policy, but most if not all said they would like for there to be a process in place. Though I will point out that George Mason currently has an offensive metadata form available on their library libguide. So if patrons find a phrase or a word that they have a problem with or that perhaps they would like to see changed in some way, they can fill out that form. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, some staff had reported that their libraries had written DEI statements or the like. Our subgroup believed it would be a good idea to collect these statements in a centralized place. So links to these different statements and other similar initiatives are currently available on the documents page of the WRLC metadata base camp. And as you can see on the slide, some of the schools that have written statements are American University, Catholic University, Howard University, George Washington, Georgetown, and George Mason Universities. Some of these are mission statements, others are diversity statements, one is a social justice libguide. Most, if not all, make mention of the strong need for ongoing conversations on topics like diversity, implicit bias, racial reconciliation, and they call for action towards intentional inclusion and diversification. Next slide. Now, specifically in terms of cataloging, one initiative brought forth by the subgroup has been the addition of the Homosaurus vocabulary to the WRLC network zone. Now, the network zone is where uh, most of our shared catalog records live in Alma and are accessible in Primo. I'm sure most of the catalogers in the group already know this, uh, but most catalog records use Library of Congress subject headings to describe the subject of the item. Now, some catalogers, both in the consortium and outside of the consortium, have started adding subject headings from the Homosaurus vocabulary in addition to Library of Congress. Homosaurus is an international linked data vocabulary of LGBTQ plus terms. And these terms are often more specialized and precise than those found in the regular Library of Congress subject headings. With the addition of the authority records in our network zone catalog, all Homosaurus subject headings in a bibliographic record are linked to their respective authority record, thereby by allowing greater search capabilities for patrons. Next slide. 
so let's take the term queer biracial people as an example. This is a real subject heading that is part of the Homosaurus vocabulary. As you see on the image on the left hand side, this is a subject heading in a 650 field of a bibliographic record. Now that we've added Homosaurus authority records to our network zone, this subject heading is linked to its respective authority record, which you can see on the right hand side of the screen. And in Alma, you know that a heading is linked when you see the little handcuff image next to it. So because this is a linked heading, if a patron were to search for one of the non-preferred terms in a 450 field of the authority record, the search would yield this bibliographic record still because the heading is linked. That's one of the main benefits of adding authority records to a network zone, especially for a vocabulary like Homosaurus that uses contemporary and specific language to describe a complex topic. Next slide. Another ongoing initiative of the Reparative Cataloging subgroup is the creation of a Library of Congress subject heading newsletter or LCSH newsletter. As many of us are aware, the Library of Congress is constantly updating and revising their subject headings. Our subgroup's quarterly LCSH update is a list of recent subject heading uh, approvals, additions, or revisions, all for terms that are more inclusive and or handle marginalized groups. The first report was included in the WRLC newsletter in February of 2022, and the end goal is to include a report in the newsletter every quarter so that there will be four total every year. One example of a recent update to a Library of Congress term, recent as in the past few weeks, um, is the change of the heading art comma primitive to either just art or art comma prehistoric depending on the subject of the item. And they also made a similar change to sculpture, comma, primitive, architecture, comma, primitive, et cetera. And using a word like primitive to describe a culture or an art form automatically has a negative connotation. But when you look at the synonyms for the word primitive, words like prehistoric, ancient, antique. These words mean very similar things, but don't have as negative a connotation or they don't have any negativity at all. So it's really simple changes like these, a uh, reevaluation of our use of language that is the crux of reparative cataloging, realizing the power of language, realizing the inherent biases in our use of language, and taking small but effective steps to remedy that bias, even if it's something as simple as changing one subject heading at a time. <laughs> All right, next slide. And I think now I will pass it on over to Tricia McKenzie. Hi, so I'm gonna talk about um, future plans and how to get involved with the reparative cataloging subgroup. Um, so, as you've seen, members of the reparative cataloging subgroup have instigated many positive changes to our records since the group began in March 2021. In addition to what was already described by Jackie, we initiated a thorough re-examination and testing of Alma's current authority control functions, which led the metadata committee led to the metadata committee's vote to turn on authority control jobs in the network zone. With this turned on, we have found that Alma authority control significantly facilitates and streamlines our ethical cataloging work. To date, we have already adopted a number of local subject headings in the network zone, and you can see this list here. We've definitely made some progress, but there is more to do. We can't wait for the Library of Congress to update all the harmful terms, harmful language in their vocabularies, 
or for new vocabularies to be established. So our work continues. This Friday, the metadata committee will discuss a new workflow that will facilitate making suggestions for replacement or supplemental headings to our bibliographic records in the network zone. Our hope is that this workflow will further simplify our efforts to make our catalog more inclusive. In addition to this more technical side of reparative cataloging work, we hope to um, recruit more access services, subject librarians, special collections, and reference folks to work with us on the report re, uh, on the cataloging reparative cataloging subgroup. Excuse me. No matter what, we will continue to meet, collaborate, and share ideas on how to make our records more equitable, representative, and humane. Um, slide, please. And you can move to the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so some details about the reparative cataloging subgroup. We meet on the last Wednesday of the month, except for today, obviously. Um, our meetings are open to all. We post reminders about meetings on Basecamp. Our meetings are recorded to be shared, and we have a Slack channel for real-time collaboration. And as I said before, this is to public-facing colleagues specifically, we want you to be part of this group. You will bring to us your perspectives and experiences of working with patrons, something that many, many of us, many of catalogers just can't provide. And we really hope that you'll consider joining our subgroup. Next slide, please. If you see something, say something. If there is a heading that should be updated, revised, or added, let us know. There's a formal process for reporting that will be available soon. But until that time, you can certainly contact your local subgroup rep or your, your local metadata committee rep. Next slide, please. Before we get to the questions, I just want to say that none of this work would have been possible without many people from across the consortium and a myriad of different departments who are committed to a more equitable and repre represent representative, I can't pronounce, sorry, description um, in, our, in our bibliographic records. Thank you. Any questions? Don't see any questions in the chat, and it doesn't look like any hands are raised. But yeah, certainly feel free to ask anything. Um, and if you think of something in like half an hour or whenever we're done, here's our contact information if you need it. All right, uh, Aaron asks, since so much metadata comes from OCLC, to what degree are they participating in these efforts? Well, OCLC um, has definitely embraced a lot of the reparative description work. Um, they're allowing homosaurus terms within the um, primary records within the WorldCat. They've gone through, and I can't remember off the top of my head, but they've gone through and updated other terms within the uh, within WorldCat records. And I know they keep up to date on any Library of Congress subject headings. Yeah, I was just gonna say OCLC is very good. As soon as Library of Congress changes something, it'll be changed in the OCLC record. They're very good at updating those. And, and one of the great things about them allowing other thesauruses or thesauri and controlled vocabularies within 
uh, connection or not connection uh, within WorldCat is that any work that we do, that we can add those to those records so then they're available to everybody else. Just in case there's an area where Library of Congress is a little slow to change the subject heading. Uh, question from the chat. Can you share a little bit about how harmful language is discovered and prioritized for change? Seems like there would be a lot. Uh, for in the WRLC, um, the reparative cataloging subgroup, this started a few years ago, right before the subgroup was founded, where the metadata committee um, part of the illegal aliens, undocumented citizens, those subject heading changes and revisions, um, the WRLC decided, or the metadata committee decided to change those and, and looked at all of the various different things that we could do. And that spun off and developed the, the uh, reparative cataloging subgroup. And as far as discovering that, it's really up to individuals to discover that, but the subgroup does prioritize certain things based upon what are priorities from members. And yes, there are a lot, but progress over perfection, we will change things over time. And adding in the Homosaurus, uh, local authority records are certainly helping a lot. I didn't want to interrupt you before, and it also took me a while to get the document, but um, what Jen was referring to earlier about adding WRLC local headings, um, those were for terms, uh, it used to be illegal aliens, and then Library of Congress changed it to non-citizens, um, but we have still kept our local heading of undocumented immigrants, and it's different for every institution but some institutions uh, configured their primo so that the term non-citizens doesn't appear, the term alien property doesn't appear, just the local heading appears, and others didn't do any behind the scenes configuration. So you see, you see both headings, I think. Um, so another aspect of that is not just cataloging, but it's also changing your primo configurations to conceal certain headings and, and display other headings. So it's a little confusing sometimes. And I would add that we don't just wait for people to report headings. Um, I, we are, as I stated, you know, we have very active individuals who are committed to this work and often, um, you know, we'll use other, refer to other other sources such as cataloging lab and their harmful terms. Um, we'll look at that. We, we are collecting things. Um, we have a spreadsheet in Basecamp where people can report, you know, add to things, um, add, add harmful terms and phrases to a list. So we have already a, a running list of things that we um, are hoping to update. And I, I, while we're waiting for other questions to come in, I do want to mention that the reparative cataloging subgroup meetings are open. So you can uh, join us anytime you want to. You don't have to be a formal member. And we are always looking for additional help if there's some project that you particularly uh, would like help with or would like to really collaborate with uh, some of our consortial members across. WRLC, feel free to contact us. 
part of the reason why we developed this subgroup was to help really make uh, all of these efforts more con or streamline these efforts across the consortia. So not every institution has to reinvent the wheel in doing this. Also, um, the link for our, our Zoom meetings are posted on the metadata base camp before we meet every month. And I, f I was going to say something else. Now I forgot. <laughs> oh, as to just reiterate what Trisha said earlier, we are definitely uh, open to accept new members. And I know. From my speaking for myself, I think it would be really helpful if we got input from reference librarians and or the access services side of things. When you work in cataloging, um, there is a tendency to be focused on what you see in the record, but you don't always know what patrons notice or what search terms patrons are using. And I think that's something that would be incredibly valuable to the work that we do. And yes, so Alan, Mark at GW said, our documents are in Basecamp as well. Yes, a lot of our documents, if not most of them are available on the metadata Basecamp. Uh, and Trisha mentioned that our Slack channel is also good for sharing of webinars, resources, and et cetera. And you can join the Slack channel um, no matter what. I know at GW, there's a little bit of trickiness with some of our email addresses. So if you're at GW, we might have to send you an invite, but the link should allow anybody to join the Slack channel. I'm going to put the Slack channel again in the chat for anyone. Well, I guess if there's no other questions and uh, no other feedback or comments, it's been wonderful to at least see everybody virtually and let us know. Um, you have our email addresses, you have the Slack channel, if you're on the metadata, Basecamp or e-resources, uh, most of us do have access to both of those. Please do feel free to contact us anytime.